So, all right, what do we got this week? A new Lytro documentary brings to life new image tech in the eyes of five different photographers. All right. Uh, I guess there's a new Canon camera out there, or it's coming out. And rumors on a new Nikon D800 replacement. Let's focus on that. All right, everybody, welcome to After Chat, episode 11. Once again, I have forgotten to get into the, uh, quite a habit of mine. Uh, but as you heard in the bump, we've got some fun things. It is kind of a light news week after the big lens announcement yeah. last week. Um, so, to be quick on the news, and then we got a bunch of other topics to talk about, which is kind of a, a nice change from just the news, 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 because I don't want to be a newscaster forever. I, I want to have fun. So, Ryan, tell me about oh, this yeah. uh, D800 rumor. So, apparently there's Nikon rumors. They, they were talking about look, looking for specs for the D800 refresh rumors. At this point, they're saying more information in June, but for now, probably a refresh 36 megapixel sensor, selling only one model with no low pass filter, so no D800E, D800 normal. It'll be just a D800S most likely with no low pass filter. The XP4 or F4A if they update it. Image processing for faster image, image push throughout, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> uh, higher resolution screen, same, a smaller RAW format. It's a couple of improvements like you see in the D4S. Uh, most importantly, the, probably the ISO performance. Um, a refresh in weight, too, is a thing. So ISO performance for a low light photography getting a little better would be great with a D800 and being a little lighter, because that thing is fat. I think it is pretty fat. I love it, man, I love it, but it's, they're fat. So, yeah, I know we're not, we're not gonna see more details officially until oh, yeah. the end of June. I know this is coming out of Nikon rumors. So yeah, end of June but, is a while, but there'll probably but, still be more for first cameras and. Yeah, but one of the, 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 the two things I, I see on the, the leaked spec list that kind of catch my eye are, is the, the small raw format. Yeah. Because Canon's been doing that for a while. Why don't, why get, why don't, well, I mean, for maybe for the 36 megapixel sensor, I could see it, but I use it. I use it well, on uh, mine all at, at work. I use it because I don't need super high res images. I just like raw files. But storage is so cheap. Right. But see, if I take a super high res image at work when I'm doing things like technical yeah, diagrams, if it's in raw. You still have to convert it anyway. I have to convert it, but it's a lot less memory hog on my low end computer. I use at the office. Yeah. So that's actually the one time I've ever found it useful, is that that machine is just so low end that it doesn't like giant raw files. I mean, it processes them, but it, it hates them. Um, that and the little note here that it might have 4K video. I doubt, no. I you don't think so? No. No, they don't have the processing. I mean, the, the amount of data that it takes is really high for a DSLR. Even with the X Speed 4? I just don't see it. If it's not in a... 5D Mark III at this point, it's not going to be in a 36 megapixel sensor. That's true. It's already clunky. Like, it, the, the amount of bandwidth you need to do that and the, the processing you need to do that's really heavy. I, All right. It'd be cool, but I don't see it. I'm, if, just, I'm just wondering if they were trying to, if that was, you know, a possibility because of the A7R being able to do 4K now. That's a possibility. I, that they might be trying to... I'd Keep be people from moving from Nikon to Sony if they're going to be using it for digital cinematography. Yeah, would be a good idea. I, I think they could use the boost, but I don't, I don't know. Right. Yeah, I mean, the fact that we haven't seen a Canon camera that can do 4K or even rumored to do a 4K outside of the cinema series, I mean, the regular DSLRs aren't, aren't doing it. They're not even talking about it. It's kind of scary to someone who's looking at where digital cinematography is going. And so many people use a 5D Mark III for cinema. I mean, I use a 6D because I'm happy with it and it does everything I want, but I only need to shoot at 1080 because let's face it, I work with Jesse and he's not willing to work in 4K because he doesn't have the computing power to handle it on the back end. Well, and you don't want to work in 4K most of the time anyway, unless you have the overhead for it. Like it's, it's not something. Yeah. 4K is obviously. It's coming. It's already here. It's just, it's, not a commonplace thing. No, but it, it'll get there. It's expensive. It'll, it, it'll stay expensive. It's one of those, it's going to stay expensive. People don't need 4K video recording yet. 
True. I mean, that, that, well, I didn't think we needed 1080 for the longest time. We need 1080. It's not a question there, but 4K is not something people need now. Yeah. Because what are you going to watch it on? Nothing. You can buy one of those old Samsung Ultra curved 4K televisions, like the 90-inch one yeah, that was at CES. Yeah. Oh, it's a 4K <laughs> television that also is the size of a wall. That's not really impressive to me. And it has to curve out from the wall so you can enjoy it. <laughs> you can buy 4K monitors, but it's like, they're $4,000. Oh, the new uh, 27 or 29-inch Apple Cinema display is 4K. And $4,000. And $4,000. Something like that. See, it, it's... It's yeah. The name, the naming resolution is nice. It's four thousand dollars for four K. I was trying to come up with a one to one correlation, but uh, well, it's a dollar a thousand pixels, right? It, it's a dollar per no, because four K is the horizontal scan lines. Yeah. So it's a dollar per horizontal scan line. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad my 1920 1080 monitor doesn't have that. It'd be a two thousand dollar monitor. So, so not to be outdone. Uh, it's a different thing. It's a different thing altogether, but not to be outdone on not having things to have news back to back. This uh, was last week, wasn't it? This, this was last week. Uh, the rumor is, because no one at Canon will actually confirm this, but people who have them in their hands have kind of been like, I can't break my NDA, but, you know, let me talk about this. Uh, so Canon Rumors is reporting that the 7D Mark II is out in the field right now. And by out in the field, I mean specifically, it's going to the World Cup. The prototypes are, we're putting the hands of sports photographers to go to the World Cup and shoot with. Hmm. Which, the 70 Mark II doesn't seem like a big deal, but it's their first replacement camera of a pro-bodied APS-C sensor camera. So that's, you know, it's it's the smaller sensor, so you can actually get you know on you know you throw on a 400-500, and it's a 1.6 crop factor. You know, that's got 640 to 800. Yeah, it's a very dense sensor, and, and it's a it's, very dense sensor. Like it's still a 20 megapixel sensor. You're not losing anything on it. In fact, yeah, they're great cameras. They are great cameras. Much so, like the 7000 is for the Nikon, it's a very similar idea where it's it's a very high end. Yeah, crop sensor. The other thing with this is they are introducing the, uh, they're, they're putting into it, you know, the 20 megapixel sensor, but they're putting in the dual pixel sensor that they put in the 70D, except at 20 megapixels as opposed to uh, 18, um, which allows it to take stills and video simultaneously. Oh. You don't actually have to break your video to take your still and go back to your video. It just kind of says, okay, I'm going to take this other set of pixels and record the still. So. Cool. Yeah. Um, as far as stats, it's pretty much the same in most of their categories. It is a little bit lighter, just like that D800S might be. Um, it does have a little bit bigger screen. They're going from a 2.8 to a 3.0 inch LCD. Uh, it does eight frames a second, which is actually pretty quick. quick. Yeah, it's quick. But they're, they it's are a crop aiming sensor, and yeah, it's... on a crop sensor, and they're trying to aim it at you know, sports photographers to start with. Um, it has a 19 point autofocus, which for anyone who wants to make any fun of Cam Canon, and I do it myself, Canon is not known, except for their super high-end cameras, for having a lot of autofocus points. I don't care about autofocus, autofocus point number. It's the... The sensitivity? It's, well, no, it's the location. Well, yeah, but by having 19, they're actually going out more. They actually have better... Yeah. Which is nice, because I, I will admit that I'm not happy with the location of my autofocus points, but... I'm not happy with my autofocus in general, so you can... Yeah. Use your damn camera and shut up. Uh... And its cross-sync speed is actually at 1 250th, as opposed to 1 200th. Yeah. Which... Which it's crop sensor. That's it, a lot of them were. They yeah. Are and which just means you can use your fast flash just a little faster. Um, it's the same way on the... Uh, yeah. And then... 800, I think. Is the 800? Yeah. I think the 800 is 250, and the... Uh, yeah. The 600s are 200. Yep. That's better than the 180th I have on this thing. Um, the other thing, there's one more in here. I was like, oh, the optional Wi-Fi, which means you're gonna have to buy the external Wi-Fi adapter. Which, honestly, in that camera, I think is much more useful, uh, especially a crop sensor camera like that. I'd see it you, you, much well, more often with the Wi-Fi. Yeah, because I have the Wi-Fi in in mine, and I don't use it. I, there are times I wish I could use it, but even the Wi-Fi that's built into cameras now is not. 
smooth enough to work with phones a lot of the time. Your phones or tablets? A lot of, like, I, I, I own the Wi-Fi adapter for my camera, and the software is bad enough that, and the connection's finicky enough that I don't use it when I could. Like, a lot of times, I like to, I like to pull a picture and send a JPEG on Facebook or something. I don't. I just wait, because it's a pain yeah, in the butt. I, I've never turned the Wi-Fi on on my camera. I've thought about doing it for just that. Like, oh, I took this awesome picture. Let me... You know, Facebook is just Facebook it. Facebook. It's going to be awesome. And it's like such a pain to set up. Uh, but with the new Lightroom update, a lot of the Wi Fi can now talk to Lightroom, which they, excuse me, they couldn't before. And even with that, just the, even though it's like 802.11n, it's super, supposed to be super fast. It's only. It's not. It's yeah. not fast enough to use as wireless tethering, it's not there yet. And I think part of that might be on Adobe's end because they still have to try and, they had to reverse engineer the different Wi-Fi's because they're meant to talk only to their own app. Yeah. And it just, it's just slow. I If I'm in here, I still use the corded tether. That's basically the only way to really do it. There are third party solutions for Wi-Fi that are quicker, um, which are actually kind of interesting and not always that expensive. They're, I forget the name of it entirely now. Wi-Fi? No. Not iFi? No, there's there's, there's another one? there's third party USB based Wi Fi where it just okay. it supplants wire connection to wire connection without okay. slowing down in the middle. Um, but it's like a, it's a box. It's kind of hmm. it's bulkier. But they seem to work very well. Hmm. Might be something to look at. They they were a couple hundred dollars, something something about that price range where it was a quick Wi Fi USB connector, but hmm. All right. I can't remember the name of it. But it's it was an interesting idea. Yeah, that, I mean, I'd love to do wireless tethering. It's just not there yet. Yeah, it's it's not fast, and it's not that big of a deal anyway. No. I like if you're it, anywhere where you really can tether, you're probably close enough to use a cable. Yeah. I, I'm i not always super quick to tether either. Oh, but well, I know. You like to shoot right in camera. I, I like to tether. I, I, mean, I do. I like to tether. It's just my camera has had difficulties tethering to a lot of Lightroom versions because it's a 600, so it's... It as sort of, and I, I most of the time I'm not in the studio, so it, yeah, I'm used to shooting. And, if you're not in the studio, so I'm used to my screen and how my screen reacts to sharpness and color. Well, I, mean, I, um, I, I would say the same for shooting in the field. I just when I'm in here, if I'm in this room, I like to tether. It's yeah. just it's no, something else about having the big screen that you can see it on more or less right away. It also really helps when you're working with well, not so much with portraits because people don't care. But if you're working with models, it's great because you can just, I can just take that monitor and flip it around on my desk so it's facing them. And they see what I see right away. Yeah. And it makes them happy because they can see exactly, you know, if they're not happy with the way a shot came out, they can tell me that right away. Oh, the 70 Mark II is a touchscreen. It is? Did I miss that? That's, oh, yeah, it is a touchscreen. That's not, I don't like those. You don't like the idea of the touchscreen? I really screen? don't like touchscreens in professional cameras. I don't get it. You should never be using the screen to operate the camera. You really shouldn't. But you know they're going to have all the buttons still because I, I get they're, that, not gonna, they're not going to go to like the... I the, feel like touchscreens are, are just inherently more fragile for no reason. No, no, let's throw my iPhone around a bit. It's not an iPhone. It's a crappy Sony... But what I'm saying is if you've got a Gorilla Glass back you know, fronted touchscreen, you're probably fine. Yeah. I don't know. I have just... Touchscreens. I feel like it adds clunkiness to your menus for no reason. Because it's not that big of a screen. It's a three-inch screen. Well, I'm hoping it's not actually for the menus, like the menus you'd still use, but like if you want to zoom rather than having to hit plus plus, you can just go. I don't see that's easier. But it's just. I, don't know, I, I do. I, I think if you could, the only thing I would use it is for. Is to swipe back and forth between photos. Swipe between we photos. We have the little dialy thing that can people love. I do love my dialy thing. But if you're sitting there talking to somebody, you don't want to have to, you know, you can just sit there and go boom, 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 boom. Oh, let me see that. Boom. Holding this giant professional camera that you... You're just swiping by. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. It, yeah. It, 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 we'll have to get our hands on one when they come out and, and see what there is to see. That will be at Hunt's. Yeah. We'll be able to go that's, down that's and, an and play one. with it. They'll let us play with it. We spend enough money The there. crop sensors are... We're not going to buy one. We're just going to play know, with but it. The, I understand why people buy them. I, I would like to own a crop sensor, but I would never put the money out to buy a crop sensor when I have a full frame. When I have a full frame and I shoot event work, which needs the ISO performance. Yep. It's like, eh, 
Well, I, I know people who have crop sensors specifically because they shoot sports and they don't want a full That's frame why I would love to own a 7300 is for just wildlife stuff. Yeah. Really. Because they, they want the crop factor. They want the additional zoom. I, I could see it. I just, it's just so tough for events because mm. you're still fighting that crop, which is getting better, but I'm so happy I have a full frame sensor now. Yeah. Because I've shot events on that and I've shot events on that. And I'd rather shoot events on that every day. <laughs> Besides the fact it's eight years newer and has better ISO performance. Just the fact that I can get closer to somebody and take a picture. Because you, you are, you're limited. You have that, that crop factor, which is, you know, if you consider it a zoom factor, you would just have to be further away from your subject. Yeah, there was one wedding I shot that as um, my, my D600 was at Nikon and I borrowed a 7000 and I was shooting with somebody who had a 7D which was kind of funny because I fell into shooting with the crop sensor and shooting like closer to how he was shooting. But mm -hmm. the whole time, it's like, this is not how I would normally shoot any of this. No, no. This is a completely different. No, no it's, it's, it's a different way of, of shooting. That, that was the hardest part of making the switch was, oh my God, I have to get so much closer to people now, which was nice. Well, the, the very nice thing about Nikon with the 77,000 series and the 600 series, that they're the same camera. Mm -hmm. So you can interchange them in your hands very quickly. Yep. And it doesn't change anything. Except where the location of the zoom and minus buttons are. <laughs> the entire camera is exactly the same control scheme, except on the back, the plus and minus buttons are flipped. Just to piss you off. I, I, I'm convinced there's no other reasoning behind it other than just to piss people off. <laughs> I, I did that. like The whole two weeks I was using that camera, I did that for like 800 times. It's smashing the minus button to zoom in. Yeah, that, that, how'd that go for you? I mean, the camera worked very well. It performed no, well. No, just by hitting the minus button to zoom in. It's There's no way to override that? You can't customize your menus? You can't customize the plus minus button on the back to be minus plus. No. Well, you should get a Canon. No, I shouldn't. <laughs> oh, well, I, I would have no problem with a Canon. I can't afford to buy a bunch of Canon shit right now, can I? No, I couldn't afford to buy a bunch Mr. of Mr. Like 30% yeah. expensive. 30% more expensive for the same or lesser quality equipment. Until you go third party. Then it's the same price. Yeah. That's why I've gone third party for most of my stuff. There's nothing wrong with third party. I would use first party, which is way cheaper. <laughs> All right. So we talked a couple of weeks ago about the Lytro Ilum, which we Ilum. finally figured out how to pronounce properly. Um, and one of the is things. Is it really Ilum? Illum, because it's supposed to be Illuminate. Okay. So it's Illum. Yeah, I know. It, well, that, that's one of the things they addressed in this documentary, was how do you pronounce it? That's probably, that's probably the first thing in the video. It, it is. Illum. They don't actually say, this is how you pronounce it. They just make sure that they say it. Yeah. Like, and they're like, a month ago, we gave five photographers the Lytro Illum camera. Illum camera. <laughs> um, but what they did is, is actually, it's an 11-minute documentary. It's actually pretty good. Um, it's interesting. I shouldn't say it's really good. It's kind of slow, kind of drags out, but it's a documentary. You kind of expect that. Um, what they did was they gave five photographers an ilum, and they sent a camera crew around with them to track them using it. And they had, I can't remember all five of them. They had a fashion photographer. They had a diorama photographer. They had a sports photographer. They had a guy jumping out of airplanes. He called himself an action photographer. That's right. Action, yeah. And then what was the fourth, fifth guy? That's four out of five. That was better than I did when I was it's telling you about this. Motocross. No, that was the sports guy. Oh. Oh, artistic shooter. Artistic shooter. And they went out and documented them learning how to use the camera and getting their, their final images. Now, one of the great things about this being a YouTube video is when they got the final images, they could show... The, the zooming around and moving around in it. Uh, but they, it was really interesting to see how five totally different styles of photography could use the same device. Um, the fashion one didn't make much sense. Yeah. I'll be on, absolutely honest with you. Um, because there really aren't that many things you're going to highlight in a fashion shot. Maybe when the, like, the final walkthrough would be a decent shot Maybe. of all the models together. Maybe. But that'd be about it. And this yeah. was, what well, they were just doing a one model cover shoot. Oh. 
So yeah. it wasn't even like a, a fashion runway show. It was a in the studio. They happened to be shooting cover for this magazine and brought the the Lytro with them. Yeah, that's kind of a punt. I don't get that. Yeah, that one that one felt a little forced. Um, the diorama photographer was actually the most interesting because she builds the scenes and then photo photographs them from different. Photographizes them. Photographizes them. Strategery. Um, from different angles and tries to get all the detail, but they, she needs multiple shots to get everything. And with this, she was able to do it all with one shot. Um, plus the fact that it has a zero distance to the lens. Like, it can hmm. focus at zero because it's not focusing at all. Yeah, that's true. That's um, interesting. Yeah, she was able to like put things that were like right against the lens and still be able when, to pull all the way out and be able to see them. Hmm. So that, that was actually the most interesting. How much is this thing? It's $1,000. Uh, no, 1600 Damn. It was $1,500, uh, but the pre-sale orders are closed now. So it'll be 1600 You only get the 100 bucks off if you pre-ordered. Well, if Matt Norris buys one, we'll, uh, we'll have fun with it. Yeah. I um, think I may have helped him convince himself that he needs to but he needs one we'll see well for the stuff he does it actually he told me to, he told me to tell him to not buy it and it didn't work out for him tell me not to buy this matt buy this no it's like i don't know it's pretty cool um it's like i'd use it for weddings it sounds like a great idea <laughs> um sports photographer was really interesting because he went took it to a, a, a motocross mm -hmm. i don't know the thing where they jump up and they do stunts oh bmx the bmx um, and so he was able to capture the course, and you know, obviously you can capture all this at once. He captured the course and the rider doing the stunt and the fans reaction all at the same time. And you don't have to be at like F22, so you don't, you know, you can actually capture it super, super quick. And the fact he could capture the trick and then you could, pan, you could pan back, I guess that's the best way to describe it. It's kind of panning back. You kind of push back into it and you can actually see people's faces. That was probably, I, I thought, one of the better uses of it. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, the action guy was using it to catch people jumping out of airplanes. Did they do any event stuff? That's, that's one they of those things. I can, I can think of a thousand ways I'd use this in an event. And no, they, they didn't do any event stuff. I don't have to it's call It's all posed them. or, you know, or like... The, or it must mean the light sensitivity is terrible. Maybe. Right? Like I, I don't know. Because I, I could see a wedding. You could have a lot of fun with this. I wedding. would totally run that at a wedding. And, and if you watch it, just watch it. I think it's the first guy, so you don't even have to watch it very long. It was the artistic photographer. He's out in Oregon. They went out in the woods, and they basically covered this guy in flour, so he looked like yeah. some sort of... And then as it cracked, because it was raining, it would, like, crack and fall off, and they'd keep putting it on him and taking pictures. It looks awesome. And the fact that it, you could focus from his hand to his face to his body to the background is, like, the one that actually made the most sense of all of them. And uh, all these are in that in in the uh, Lytro library, I guess it is the gallery they have up on their website, um, which is still phenomenal to go look at. Yeah. Um, but it it was very interesting because, like I said, I wanted to see what people would do with it if they got it in their hands, and some things work and some things don't, and that's fine. Like I don't see fashion ever going to it. To be honest with you, I just don't see fashion photographers ever being able to use it. Um, the actual one was kind of fun because the guy could get the focus on the jumper's face and then, you know, you know, they were tandem jumping. Oh, yeah. So you could get the instructor who looked absolutely calm and ready to go and then the person who was jumping with him was absolutely horrified. And so you could go back and forth between them and then you could also um, pan over to, because, you know, they've got the altimeter on, the, on like a wristwatch. So you could see the scared person, the 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 calm person, and then you could go over the altimeter and see what you, what you could see there. That's cool. So yeah, that, that was pretty awesome. So that, those, those were definitely the, the better ones with the action and the artistic. The, the diorama was definitely cool though. Hmm. So I didn't understand what she did to start with, like why would you build dioramas and take pictures? But there's, <laughs> there, she sells a lot of prints, so. Oh yeah. Uh, you know what? Uh -huh. Something good for her. Um, so, did you do anything fun this week? It's been a long couple of weeks. Feels like I've been running around for three days. Well, Constantly, every three days. But Well, that's why I didn't ask if you did anything fun last week. That way what you was last two weeks. week? I don't know. I don't know. You've had two weeks now to come up with something fun you did. I, two weeks ago, we did the, the antiques fair. We talked about that yep. briefly. That's on my Flickr. 
Um, I played a bunch of board games, mini golf, and other random stuff you do during the summer. All right. Basically. Oh, you shot a wedding. Oh, yeah. Weddings is work on Saturdays. One wedding in the last two weeks. Yes. Yeah. Hey. Wedding. Wedding was interesting. There was some fun stuff. Well, pocket wizards yelling, not working like they're supposed to. But Yeah, have you figured out the, the uh, AC3 yet? Oh, the AC3, it's, it's easy to figure out. It's just it's when it no, hypersync no longer works that you have to figure out why that is. All right, yeah, because I know you when you got it, you were all you you were like, it's easy gonna take me forever to figure it's out. It's not it's forever to figure out. It's forever to figure out why it stops working occasionally. That's what you call pocket wizard. You click it in a manual and the hypersync stops working. And there's no reasoning for that. It should still work. Yeah. It doesn't. So I have to figure that out. It's all right. All right. Well, uh, I upgraded the uh, the studio oh, computer yeah. here. Um I have to do mine at some point. Well, I, I basically just took mine to where yours is because mine was kind of behind it. Yeah. Uh, we put in a solid state drive, which if anyone was following on the Aperture Chat blog the, this past week, uh, you'll notice that the episode last week didn't go up until Saturday morning, uh, mostly because I couldn't get the computer working. It was not fun. Um, I still haven't quite figured out what the problem was, but Premiere has stopped being a pain in my ass. Um, it kept crashing. I haven't figured out why. No one else I've talked to can figure out why. I mean, I think Grant had issues with SSDs too at some point, but uh, I don't think he ever solved his, so. I think he did no. the same thing you did. It just kind of worked. It, it just started working. I, I had to tweak some settings. I, I changed some things. It started working. Um, but yeah, I put the SSD in. I upgraded from Premiere CS55 to Premiere CC. Oh, yeah. So that might have been part of the problem. Because I did both these things at the same time. When I got the drive up and I got Windows installed, which, by the way, is its own level of hell these days. Oh. Whine so about it. I'm going to whine about it because I can. Because it's my podcast. Uh, I installed Windows. And it took my key and I was all happy and it activated. And then I went and looked at it and it said 32-bit. And I went, no, no, no. I grabbed the wrong CD. So then I went and grabbed the 64-bit CD that we had sitting around. Except it was the wrong version of Windows. It was 7 Pro, it not 7 Ultimate. It has more to do with your key than the Windows itself. Exactly. We went through this. You had an OEM key from MSDN, and it, that only right. does one thing. If you right. buy a premium key for whatever the fuck it costs now. But I already own this I, key. I know. But the, that's. So I'm not going to buy a key. I'm just saying the issue you had is very right. specifically related to your OEM thing. Normal Windows keys will activate anything. But So then I went and got an image from the MSDN website of 7 Ultimate 64 bit with Service Pack 1. And then my key worked. Yeah, because that's what the key was for. Yes. Well, it wasn't Service Pack 1, but that's fine. It does it anyway. Um, so yeah, that, that after like three installs of Windows, I finally got that running. And then. Trying to remap everything to the right place because I have the two drives now. Yeah. Because the SSD is only 120 gigs. It's not big. Yep. Um, so I tried to, like, the, I had to remap my documents, my videos, my it's pictures. It's not hard. You move the folder. It's not hard. But you just move the folder and it does it. It's Windows. But what I actually wanted to do, and this is where it got a little tricky, was I wanted to move the whole user's folder to the other drive which you can't do while you're in Windows because you're using files that are in those folders. Yeah, but the desktop moves. So like, there's nothing in the user's folder you need to keep off the SSD that's going to store anything. The desktop moves when you move everything else. But I wanted, well, what I wanted the user's folder for was so that if any other accounts get created, they automatically populate on the D drive. Yeah. Well, it was easy enough to do. I just booted to a... USB key and I moved the folders and when I booted Windows up it worked. But just the fact I had to go through that process because I wanted to do it a specific way. You usually don't have to do the whole user's thing. If you do desktops, yeah, well, no, but desktop I, in my internet. head I was thinking Linux and in Linux you just build it that way when you install it. You put users on a separate hard drive or it's always a separate partition but yeah. you, you usually put it on a separate hard drive. And so I was just thinking like that. Because, you know, uh, aliens. Uh, but it's now up, it's running, it's happy. Yep. At least I think it's happy. I bet you oh, when I go fine. to edit this episode, it's not a problem when I edit, it's only a problem when I export. So 
I'll probably get all the way done with this tomorrow morning. And then it'll be like, mm, screw you, I don't want to export. Oh, and I installed Splash Top because yeah, that's fun. I want my computer to be as much like your computer as possible, apparently. Yeah. I use mine all the time. Um, I listen to music through it. I, like, I, I just use it for random shit. I don't know if I'll go that far. Oh, it's great. But if I could use Splash Top at work and connect to it, then I wouldn't ever have to worry about what's installed on my computer at work because I could just always use whatever's on this one. There's one thing that did kind of catch my eye last week as I was looking around at other blogs and other podcasts that we... I, I, I know all of the blogs and all the podcasts use the same news aggregator. Oh, yeah, yeah. And not only do I have I, I, I mean, we always assume this, but nothing's quite as funny as seeing, not, knowing they all use the same news aggregator because they all had the same error in their news last week, which we didn't. Yeah. Um, Good job. There was a typo on Petapixel that the new Canon white camera was called the ST1, not the SL1. Which is funny because if you, the Petapixel always puts a link to the article they're, they're quoting from. And if you click through, it was a Canon press release, which clearly said it was the white SL1, which is what I took the news from because I don't take it from Petapixel. I go that extra layer deep to, to find our articles. Although sometimes there's nothing deeper to go to because they do have yeah. some first hand writing. Uh, plus I go, I do Google search like, hey, show me Canon news, Nikon news, Sony news. And most of it's useless or it's already in Petapixel. But it was kind of amusing to me that of the four other places that, ha that shared this, this news article last week, all of them called it the ST1. And I was like, wow, okay. That's funny. It, it was just funny. I was like, okay. At least I feel a little better about what we do here, even if we get you know, less than 1% of the traffic they do. At least we're doing it right. Yeah. Shit happens. Yeah. And then I got one more thing before we close out that I want to ask you about. So. Do you have to circle it? I had to circle it. All right. Because I, well, honestly, because it looks like a penis. Oh, good. If I circled it, now it looks like. It's upside down penis. What are you doing? It's an upside down penis. Um, so last week, we were talking about the, all the rash of, and I would call it a rash because I think it's about right of F4 glass that's coming out. Yeah. And we even touched on it after we were done talking about F4 glass as to why all this F4 glass is out there. Yeah. Digital video. They don't care about 2.8. That's not completely true. It's not completely true. They, they care about just as much as you do, if not more occasionally. Occasionally. Like, that's honestly, in DSLR video event world, 2.8 glass is 2.8 glass. In event world, but in the cinematography world, if you are out in a field tracking, especially where the IS comes in, if you're, if you're hand-holding, you can't use 2.8 because your subject will go in and out of focus too much. Yeah. So the fact that this is all F4 glass is fine with them. Yeah. I, I'll just say, I, 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 it occurred to me after we were done, and then I went looking around and, and asking people, and one of the things I found out from a couple of places is the typical person who's using DSLR for cinema Shooting at five six to seven one, so two eight means nothing to them. Yeah, because from and then four to five same, six, in the same swoop, they're selling ten thousand dollar cine lenses that have a T stop of point eight. They are. You know, it's those are for super high end rigs where people are on the, you know, they're on the rigs and people have marks and they're doing and, and but I mean, if you look at like, if it was you and me playing kickball in a field and someone was recording that. They're probably going to shoot it at five six because they don't. Want, they want to be able to go from one subject outside. to the other. I mean, it's also outside, and it's yeah. not. You're not creating interest by moving your depth of field. Right. You're moving your focus where you want it. Yeah. But some of the best event photography I've ever event videography I've seen is shot mostly lower end with two eight glass and running focus through to where you want it, doing that kind of sweep into focus. A lot of the effect that brings interest to an otherwise boring scene. Boring scene, really. That's yeah, a good way to put it. It's the, the people who are buying these aren't making the boring scenes. They're making the fun scenes. Yeah. I think there's more power to compose with 2.8 glass. I, I and I think it's just 
obviously more there is more resolution in two-way glass than at four glass. It's just how it's. But if you're coming down to 1080, doesn't matter whether you have an 18 or an eight megapixel camera, if you're coming down to 1080, you're coming down to 1080. Quality of glass still matters. It still matters. And I feel like it's sort of a punt to run F4 glass when it's the cheaper solution. I, I think if it's unnecessary, it's just unnecessary. I think the people who are buying that, though, don't agree with you. I think they're buying the F4 glass, A, because it is in their budget, and they can get the IS, and they can get it cheaper, and B, because they're not as worried about the glass as someone who shoots photographs. They're not thinking in that same aspect. They're thinking, how do I get the scene I want, which moves and, you know, and all this, whereas you and I can sit there and go, okay, I want to take a picture. I want, to, I want all the bokeh. I mean, I'd have a 0 0.01 glass if it was possible, but, okay, I really wouldn't, but imagine the bokeh. It's just out of focus. <laughs> but I, it, it's, it feels like a direct correlation to the amount of money you're putting into your equipment is the amount of glass you're going to put in front of your lens. I, the F4 stuff is lighter. I understand that. That is a big part of it. No. Yep. But... If you're buying equipment, that's... It's also smaller. Yeah. You have those bonuses, and sometimes that's a big thing. A lot of the times, you're better off with the better lens. It's, they're just better lenses. It's not, it's not a matter of... Oh, I, there's I, more technology, there's more glass. There's, a, there's more of a lens in front of your thing, you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you with, uh, on the... I, I on understand the... why F4 glass is a thing and why it's popular for that. Yeah. But I feel like that's going to get, that's going to become a real big issue in three years when an F4 glass looks like crap on your new 4K SLR. And you just spent $1,200 on that lens a couple of years ago, and it looks like a turd. Congratulations. Well, Maybe not like a turd, but it's, it's no longer as high a quality as it looked mm -hmm. five years ago. Oh, yeah. It goes back to spending money places where you know it's going to last as long as it can. And that's why I don't believe in buying like variable aperture glass because it's yeah, no, I, it's right on the the top of the curve of the sensor tech. It's mm -hmm. putting as little glass as it can to accomplish its photo needs for that moment. Yep. So that's that's like Nikon, the same thing. Nikon started with an eighteen to seventy, I think, eighteen to seventy, very eighteen to seventy, three five to five six. I jumped in the D ninety era, which was an eighteen to one hundred five. 4.5 to 5.6, which was a great lens. It mm -hmm. was sharp then. And then now they're up to 18 to 200, 4.5 to 5.6. That's just as sharp as the 18 to 105 was with more megapixels behind it. Mm -hmm. And now the 18 to 105 doesn't really work as well. Really, it doesn't. I mean, 18 to 105 does not work on a, a 7300 like it would have a D90 or a D300S. So if you bought the, those lenses, they work great for a couple of years, and then they kind of fall off the curve of variable aperture crappy glass. But yeah. Oh, that that just you just reminded me with, with, by saying eighteen to two hundred. <laughs> um, uh, uh, someone I would I was I did not get involved in this conversation on Facebook. I just could not be that big a troll. Oh, I would. I know you would. Thankfully, camera stuff is not really trolly. It's this would have been trolly because this comes back to the Pentax guy again. So this would have totally been trolly. Um, he was complaining about the lack of sharpness on a lens he was using. And I'm like, okay. I, and I was like, I just didn't want to jump in on the conversation. So I just watched for a little bit and someone finally, he was being all vague. And someone was like, oh, what lens was it? Well, it was a gift. So I don't want to, <laughs> I, I don't want to get a, have anyone feel bad and blah, blah, blah. And he gets through, and people hound him a little bit, and finally, it's a Tam it's an old Tamron 18 to 200. <laughs> okay. It's probably, it's, it's probably on the list of the worst lenses ever made. He got it at the time of his Pentax, which he's going on 10 years ago. You know, when Tamron wasn't making good glass, but, oh, by the way, they were the ones making all the Pentax glass at the time. So at the time, it seemed like, oh, well, this is a Pentax, just not with the Pentax name. Yeah, that's basically when, like, 
Intel says, we're going to make all our chips i7s, and the ones that fail become i5s and i3s, because that's how they do it. Um, it's not the same thing, but yeah. It's... But it was like, okay, it didn't pass the Pentax QA test, let's kick it to Tamron. <laughs> and he was like, oh, well, and he's like, oh, I don't want to send it back because it'll cost me $150 to fix a $200 lens. And I was like, you're complaining about the fact that your lens isn't perfectly tack sharp on a $200 lens. I bought a $20 lens once. I bought some hundred dollar lenses. Well, in I, I spent it, I spent seventeen dollars on a, a four hundred millimeter um, refraction lens. Really? Was that was that hunt? And I'm like, ha ha! And I, I played with it. It was fun to play with. <laughs> it was manual focus. It was yep. a piece of shit. <laughs> but it made donut um, donut hole out of focus. Donut hole bokeh, basically. Oh, cool! Because it's a the refraction glass is like a telescope, so yep. it goes through to a donut shaped element that yep. goes up to a middle element that goes through to the sensor. And they're only this big. They're light as hell. It was dumb. It, the thing was a terrible, terrible lens, but it was still fun to play with. <laughs> I don't even know where it is. Oh, that's too bad. We could have fun with that. No, it's awful. Yeah, that was it was awful on a D90. <laughs> But anyway, I, I had I just had to laugh when he finally gets to the end. He goes, "Yeah, well, it was a two hundred dollar lens. I expect better things." And I really wanted to get in there and go, "How about you buy a real camera and some real glass?" Two hundred dollar lens? It's a, no, no lens I've ever owned for a DSLR was two hundred dollars. The, the eighteen to one hundred five kit lens that I got with my first DSLR was like two hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. <sighs> I was that like, was a thousand dollar kit too. That wasn't like a. Yeah, that's why I was just like. I could not get in on this conversation because I would have just totally trolled it for a while. Yeah. At that point. There's, there's so many fun Tamron trollies. That D90 kit, I... And, and the worst part is, the guy knows I shoot with my Tamron 7200, but it's a modern one. Yeah. And he'd probably be like, well, you shoot Tamron, and I'd yeah, be like, like oh. uh, he went from being angry to being Grover, you shoot Tamron. Yeah, Yoda. And now Yoda. They're the same thing. Frank Oz voiced both of them anyway. Um, and Miss Piggy. Oh, good. Let that haunt your dreams. Eh, eh. Um, so you'd probably be like, well, you shoot Tamron. I'd be like, yeah, I shoot modern Tamron, and mine costs a little more than 200 bucks. All right, so let's wrap this up. Oh, good. I have to reset the shit. You don't have to reset Hi. anything. I'm not going to make you reset for five minutes this week. Like we did um, last week. Like we did last week. Well, we ended up talking for 15 yeah, minutes. Yeah, okay. So, um, wow, I did it again this week. I said, oh, and then I forgot where I was going. This conversation gets a whole lot better when we all get involved. So like, comment, subscribe, share. I was really hoping you'd pick that one up. <laughs> I, I, tell you, I would rather let the awkward silence happen. I, I know, you'd rather have the awkward silence. And that's what makes this so much fun for us to do every week. Uh, so this all gets better when we all get involved. And like, comment, share, subscribe, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your fr enemies, tell your friends' enemies, your enemies' parents, your... Everybody you can ever you tell the homeless guy on the street to go to the local library and get a YouTube account and subscribe. I mean, that'd be great. Uh, really? Yeah. No, it'd be, it'd this be would be a lot better. I mean, unfortunately, this week, there's not really time for YouTube comments because I put it up two days ago, and the, all the views, no one really said anything yet. Uh, but tell us what you think. We, you know, this is the second week. Yeah. We've tried a little bump at the beginning. Um, I, I think I like it better. You know, you you were joking about how it's you know, uh, or ripping off one particular show, but then I realized no, it's basically every show has a bump before the credits at this point. Yeah. So it wasn't no, it, it wasn't one particular no. show. It works. It's a good it's a good thing. Um, and uh, here you're gonna need something to throw at the camera because that's nah. how I you better. Nah. That's how I decide when to end this thing. Nah. All right. We'll see you next week. <laughs>